Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey, before we start the show today, I want to tell you about something brand new we're launching with our friends at Apple Podcasts called The Ongoing History of New Music Unlimited. For $3.49 a month, $3.49, which is less than the price of your morning coffee, you can now get access to the full archive of our shows ad-free. Plus, you'll get brand new episodes two days early and special bonus episodes. It's Ongoing History Unlimited, and it's available right now only on Apple Podcasts. Once upon a time, many, many centuries ago, someone came up with the idea of taking all the world's available knowledge and storing it in one place. That way, anyone who had questions had somewhere to go to get the answers, and thus the concept of the library was born. Considerably later, the same concept was applied to recorded music, and governments, public broadcasters, and companies began collecting together as much of humankind's recorded audio as they could. The BBC famously has hundreds of kilometers of shelving for physical media. There's a guy in Brazil named Zero Fritas who was on a quest to create a private collection of all the records ever made. He has at least 8 million records and more than 100,000 compact discs, which is nice, but it still doesn't cover everything. In the 1980s, some people started to conceive of a giant computer somewhere that could hold humanity's music in digital form. If you needed a song, any song, it would be available from that computer instantly. In 1994, a law professor named Paul Goldstein popularized the term celestial jukebox. In his mind, this would be a networked database available to anyone with a connection to this thing called the Internet. Five years later, Napster went online, and suddenly it seemed that you could download any song you wanted, however illegal that might be. Then in 2003 came the iTunes Music Store. Starting with several hundred thousand songs, it has since expanded to about 60 million tracks, all of which are for sale. But that still doesn't quite cut it because it still involves buying this music. Today, of course, we have streaming. All the platforms draw from a digital music library that contains at least 90 million songs, and more are being added every day. And we can access this music anytime we want, from wherever we are, using whatever device we happen to have. And the price? Well, given what we're actually able to do, it's negligible. In fact, it can even be totally free. Now think about that. We can listen to virtually any song ever recorded in seconds and pay nothing. We now have the theoretical celestial jukebox, something that was considered science fiction not that long ago. Question. How well do you know how all this works? This is 23 Points You Might Not Know About Streaming, Part 2. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Welcome again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the second half of a program that looks deep into the streaming universe. It has become so easy to listen to whatever music we want that we barely think about it. It's like turning on the tap and getting water or flicking a switch and the lights go on. With these shows, I'm trying to show how bloody complicated the music streaming universe really is. And to be clear, I'm not piling on Spotify here. The reason it will be mentioned more than any other company is because it's the biggest streaming platform out there and because it's a standalone public company that only does streaming. Apple Music is owned by Apple. Amazon Music is, well, Amazon. And YouTube Music is Google. Spotify managed to attract as many subscribers as it has on its own. No other ecosystem is involved. And because it's a public company, its financial reports have to break their business into very tiny bits. So let's move on with part two, beginning with point 16, which is actually a follow-up to point 15 from the last show, which is how artists get paid. If you stream a song from an artist, you would expect that your subscription money goes to paying that artist. You know, you're listening to their song, so they should get paid with your money. Not necessarily. The way it works is that Spotify pays artists on their overall percentage share. The way it actually works is that Spotify pays artists on their overall percentage share of streams. If it's determined that, say, Justin Bieber got X percent of the streams in a given month, 
then he gets that same percentage of the money that comes in. The big criticism here is that the system favors the already rich and the already famous, and the smaller artists get squeezed out of any revenues. Now, Spotify knows this. Their own figures point out that 97% of all artists on the platform make less than a thousand US dollars a year. 97%. What this means is that artists who used to do quite well in the age of selling pieces of plastic, like records and CDs, aren't doing that well anymore. Spotify CEO Daniel Eck had this to say in 2020. Some artists that used to do well in the past may not do well in this future landscape, where you can't record music once every three to four years and think that that's going to be enough. Well, you can imagine how well that went down with the artistic community. Those margins and profits on CDs are not coming back. Streaming has supplanted the old ways when it comes to the way people consume music. There's just not the kind of money to be made streaming as there used to be in selling CDs. So you can see why there were calls for artists to be paid a penny per stream. Still, that won't make up for lost physical sales, but it would at least be something. Panic at the Disco is one of those acts who are doing okay under streaming. They're in the top 3% on Spotify, thanks to albums like Pray for the Wicked, which has around 2 billion collective streams. Moving to point 17, which is a thing that we have to discuss before we get into the issue of artist payouts again. All streaming music services work the same way. In order to qualify for a song as being officially played, you have to listen for at least 30 seconds. Anything less than that, and the artist gets nothing. Now, we will come back to that a little later, so just remember that fact for now. No one gets paid for a stream unless the song runs for at least 30 seconds. The streaming platforms are able to log each and every song with an official play. At the end of the month, they tally up all those stats and pay out according to the formula we just talked about in point number 16. Here's the key thing for this to work. You have to know exactly which songs get played. And that's an extremely complicated thing. It boils down to this. How do you identify a specific song so that you've eliminated all possibility of error. This is where we enter the universe of metadata. Metadata is the information about a song embedded within the digital file. If you have any songs purchased from iTunes, you can click on it, choose Get Info, and a dialog box will come up with a series of tabs. Each tab contains a series of fields, and if the label did their job properly, all those fields will be filled with information. Song title, artist, album title, composer, genre, year of release, length of the song, what track it is on the CD, the artwork, the lyrics, well, sometimes, and even bit rate and sampling rate. There's more, but you get the idea. That's a lot of data points. You should be able to identify the song file from that, right? Well, usually, but it's still not complete. You would think that there's a worldwide database somewhere featuring the complete metadata of every single song, but there isn't. And the reason why is because there's so much music that would need to be entered into this database. There have been attempts. One method, which is pretty good, is the International Standard Recording Code, or ISRC number. Since 1986, there have been efforts to assign a number to each and every audio recording out there. But that's way more complicated than it sounds. A song released in Canada has to be distinguished from the same song that was released in the U.S., or in the UK, or France, or anywhere else. Each release requires a new ISRC number. If a song is on an album, that's one number. If it's released as a single, that's another. If it gets remixed, that's a number for every remix. If there are live recordings, each performance gets a number. If it gets covered by someone else, that's another number, and so on and so on and so on, for every territory around the planet. Take a song like, um, oh, I don't know, Depeche Mode's Behind the Wheel. It's an album track from the band's 1987 Music for the Masses album, which was released on Mute Records. It's been re-released a number of times, on a bunch of different labels, in a number of territories. And even Martin Gore has no clue how many times this song has been remixed. Two dozen? Three? He doesn't know. And in how many countries? It's been on vinyl, it's been on CD, there have been digital files. And what kind of digital files? 
Oh, and what about the medley versions that include Depeche Mode's cover of Route 66? To do the ISRC system properly, every single one of those versions I just mentioned, and more, has to have their own number. So you begin to see the problem, right? And I'm not done with the business of identifying each individual song, either. You have to be concerned about things like spelling. Since we're talking about Depeche Mode, for example, should the metadata associated with the song Master and Servant use the word and or an ampersand between master and servant? There's a distinction there. And if we decide which version is correct, how do we make sure that everybody uses the version with that metadata, the accepted version? Okay. Here's another. Spell me Guns N' Roses. Do it right now. Where does the apostrophe go? How about a band like Panic at the Disco, which has changed the location of that weird exclamation mark over the years? That's important. Do we write out Our Lady Peace or will OLP do? And it gets even weirder in the world of hip-hop, where artists and song titles and albums use alternate or stylized spellings. I could go on, but I think you get the idea of how monumental an issue getting the correct metadata in digital files is. And here's why it's such a big deal to artists. Let's say, for the sake of argument, you have a song called I Love You. How many songs in the history of humankind have that title? Billions. So when a song called I Love You gets streamed, the streaming music services have to figure out which I Love You it is, which artist it really belongs to. If the metadata is correct and intact, no problem. But what if it isn't? What tends to happen is that they'll assume that the version of I Love You is the most popular song with that title, and the money by default will go to that artist, which could mean someone gets paid for a song they had nothing to do with. The other thing that might happen is that the revenue from our example of I Love You will be put into an account, and any number of performing rights collectives around the planet will try to track down the rightful author of that particular song called I Love You and pay them. What we've ended up with is hundreds of thousands of orphan songs. Orphan because they don't contain the proper metadata. They should be earning money, but they aren't. So the cash just sits in an account as people try to sort things out. We got a headache yet? Yeah, I do. Here's 21 Pilots. Now, remember, you do not split their name with a hyphen. If you do put a hyphen between 20 and 1, then that's a metadata issue. And don't forget that the title of the song is spelled as one word. And that just compounds issues, you know? Next up, the problem of the skip button, as we continue to look at all things about streaming that you might not realize. This is the second half of a program that looks at the insane complexities that come with streaming music. For us music consumers, it seems so simple. You think of a song, any song, call it up on our phones, and there it is. But for that to be possible, wow. This is point 18 on our journey to full streaming enlightenment. And for this one, I would like you to contemplate the skip button. In the old days of vinyl, if you wanted to skip a song in an album, you had to get up and physically move the tone arm. There were one or two super high-end models that could sense individual bands on a record and allow them to skip tracks, but those were the exception. They were very expensive, too. Same thing with some expensive cassette machines and VCRs that could pick out the blank spot or the silent bits between tracks. The skip button first really appeared with the first CD players in late 1982 and early 1983. Because of the construction of compact discs, CD players had to sense individual tracks. The circuitry made it a snap to skip tracks, and if you had a remote, as most of these things did, you could do it from across the room. This was the first dent in the wall for the integrity of the album. Instead of letting a record run, the listener could skip songs that they didn't like. Some CD players even allowed you to play tracks in whatever order you wanted. When we got to MP3s in the 1990s, skipping was our God-given right. And slowly, our attention spans got shorter. Don't like that song. Skip. Don't know that song. Skip. Hoping that the next song is better. Skip. 
By the time streaming began to take off in the 2000s, we were skipping like crazy. And that's why a universal rule was created. Here it is again. No one gets paid for a play on a streaming music platform unless the song runs for at least 30 seconds. Okay, but there's a problem. Our attention spans are shorter than that. Listen to this data. 24% of streaming listeners will skip an unfamiliar song in the first five seconds. 29% might wait until 10 seconds have gone by. But by the time the 30-second mark rolls around, 35% will be gone. This matters because streaming music algorithms keep track of song skips. The more people skip a song, the further down the song slides when it comes to recommendations. The chances of it bubbling up on a crucial playlist diminishes. So you can see where this is going, right? It's become the goal of artists and composers and producers to write songs that will hold our attention for that important first 30 seconds. And this has changed the very nature of songwriting. Shorter intros, chorus up front, adding as many sugar-high hooks as possible before the song is half a minute old. Anything to drag us through to 30 seconds so everyone can get paid their fraction of a cent. Well, so what, you may ask? Well, let me give you this example. One of the best-selling albums of all time is The Joshua Tree from U2. It starts with Where the Streets Have No Name. The song is a brilliant opener to the album with a cinematic introduction evocative of a sunrise or sunset. It begins with a keyboard drone. Around the 25-second mark, an organ resolves out of the drone. At 42 seconds, the edge's guitar fades in. The song builds until we reach one minute and nine seconds. Then there's a stab from Adam Clayton's bass, followed by Larry Mullen's drumming, and that builds and builds and builds. There's a chord change at 1 minute and 41 seconds that heralds a new phase of the song. And finally, 1 minute and 46 seconds after it began, Bono starts singing. It's a glorious start to one of the greatest rock albums ever. Now, ask yourself this. Would a new song today survive in the world of streaming with an introduction that lasts almost two solid minutes? You gotta wonder. Another thing that's happening with streaming is that we're slowly killing the concept of the album. We'll make this point number 19. The long playing album first appeared in June 1948. It was too expensive to waste on the disposable pop hit parade music of the day, so record labels used LP for things like classical recordings, Broadway shows, and maybe some jazz. Popular music, everything from R&B to country to blues, was released by the single song. And when rock and roll came along in the 1950s, the seven-inch single became its heart and soul. There were some remarkable rock and roll albums in the middle and late 1950s, but you only released an album after you had a series of singles, and then everything was packaged together with some extra tracks. But let's be very clear. The single ruled. Kids went out and bought the individual songs that they heard on the radio. But starting in around 1965, a number of artists, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, and the Beach Boys among them, began to think less in terms of individual songs and more in terms of artistic statements featuring 10, 12, or more tracks. Then came FM radio. Back in the 1960s, FM stations were the dumping ground of the radio industry. Not many people had FM radios yet. Ratings were low and revenues were weak. So many owners turned these stations over to programmers and DJs who were interested in more than the top 40 singles of the day. And they started playing album tracks. This proved to be very popular, and the recorded music industry took note that albums, with their higher profit margins, was the way of the future. The turning point came on June 1st, 1967, when the Beatles released Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, a record that was meant to be enjoyed as a whole, in sequence, over 39 minutes and 36 seconds. From that point on, the album became the currency of the recorded music business. Singles were still important, of course, but they became the thing that enticed you to buy the album. And everyone made way more money selling albums. And that's pretty much the way the industry worked until June 1st, 1999, exactly 32 years to the day after Sgt. Pepper came out. That was the moment when the original version of Napster 
was released into the wild. By this time, many people were really pissed that the recorded music industry had been phasing out singles. The attitude was, what, you want that one song? Just that one song? Too bad. Buy the whole album with a bunch of crap that you don't want. This really rankled music fans because there was a perception at the end of the 90s that most albums featured one good song and 11 terrible ones. So when Napster and other file sharing programs made it possible to acquire music a la carte, just like ordering from a sushi menu, for example, people went nuts. It also helped that the music was free. That's what file sharing was all about. Then along came the iTunes Music Store in 2003. Albums were broken up and sold as individual tracks for 99 cents. So the single was back, and the concept of the album took a hard, hard hit. Streaming has continued the assault on the concept of the album. The internet generation as a whole doesn't care about albums. We're back to the days of interest in individual songs. Albums have been largely replaced by playlists in the popular music ecosystem. Deep album cuts just don't get traction the way they used to. If people aren't listening to albums as a whole, as they once did, these deep tracks get lost in the tens and tens of millions of songs available to them. What's the point of even recording them? We are back to where we were in about 1964. Artists need to deliver a constant flow of new songs, just like the Beatles did through 63, 64, and 65, when they'd release up to a dozen singles and then summarize them with two albums a year. Two albums every year. Today, well, sorry, but they're mostly for older folk who remember the way things used to be. Again, I'm generalizing, but this is the way music is headed. And I'm sorry to say that rock music missed the boat. It didn't embrace streaming early enough, and it insisted on sticking with the business model of the album. And I'm talking about both artists and record label executives. We are seeing a once in a lifetime major shift in music creation and consumption. This is reality. Might as well embrace it. What's the last album from recent years you listened to front to back as the artist intended? For me, it was probably Tool's Fear Inoculum album, but this was one of them too. Radiohead's Moon Shaped Pool from 2016. Let's move on to point 20 about streaming. The money involved makes the whole concept too big to fail. The entire global recorded music business was worth somewhere around $21 billion at the beginning of 2021. And as I write this, Spotify has a market cap of $248 billion on its own, more than 10 times the industry it serves. Apple Music is supported by a company worth $2.5 trillion. Amazon Music, a division of Amazon, they're never going to be in any trouble. Same thing with YouTube music, which is Google, or more correctly, Alphabet. If anything, there will be consolidation in the streaming space, meaning that these companies will just get bigger. CD sales will continue to fall. Digital album sales continue to decline. And the purchase of digital tracks are cratering. The only bright spot has been vinyl, which, if we're honest, is just a niche in the grand scheme of things. Let's look at another song. This Foo Fighters track has been streamed about 400 million times just on Spotify. How much has that been worth to the band? <sighs> okay, a guess. 1.6 million US. Again, that's just this one song. A few more points about streaming to wrap things up in just seconds. This is the final stretch in a two-part program that seeks to demystify, educate, and elucidate how the streaming music universe really works. Again, as music fans, it seems so simple to be able to call up any song we want, but as we've seen, though, it's anything but. Let's talk about the relationships you and I have as music fans with any particular artist, especially a new artist. Call this point 21. And for this, we have to go back to about 2000. The year 2000 is a nice, neat division between pre-internet and post-internet artists. Let's start with the pre-internet era. Music industry revenues were peaking at all-time highs. Record stores were busy places. 
MTV and much music were very important to breaking an act, and it was still possible for an act to get so big that they could fill a stadium. Careers tended to build slowly, not as slowly as they did in the 1970s, but record labels were still investing in acts for the long term. They were still prepared to wait three, four, five albums before the act matured and had a breakthrough. And if you got on the radio with a hit record or two, well, you were golden. The acts that thrived pre-2000 are, in many cases, still thriving today. I mean, think about it. Pearl Jam, Chili Peppers, Green Day, Offspring, Rolling Stones, Paul McCartney, U2, and so on. The momentum generated from that part of their careers, the pre-2000 part, keeps them going. But artists that have risen after 2000? It's generally been a struggle, largely because it's almost impossible to make a name for yourself in the post-internet era. There's too much music, too much competition, and too much choice for music fans. And this is another example of where streaming has changed our relationship with music. Again, for many, many music fans, it is about the song. They don't necessarily care about the artist. They might not even be able to name the artist. It's just that one song that catches fire on streaming media. Could be Spotify, could be on Instagram, could be on TikTok. And that's all they have a relationship with, nothing more. People love the song, not you, as the artist. And once they're done with the song, they're done with you. That makes it extremely difficult for any new artist to build a career. The result? A growing number of one-hit wonders in the last decade. And here's one of just many examples. The last thing I want to leave you with has to do with data. Streaming is not going away. So if you're an artist, you need to know how to adapt to this new world. Chances are you're just not going to make a lot of money from streaming and you can spend the rest of your life screaming about it, but nothing's going to happen. But if you can, however, use the data from streaming to advance your career. In fact, it's all about the data these days. Spotify and the rest of them have turned into Moneyball. The insane amount of data that can be harvested from the streaming platforms makes it possible to identify trends and opportunities in ways never before possible. Labels all have their own internal analytics departments, and there's a slew of companies that will help any musician track how and where their music is being consumed. And you can see exactly how each one of your songs is performing anywhere in the world in real time. This data is also dictating the course of music culture. We can see what sorts of songs are getting traction at any given second, and not just by genre, but by length and key and chord progressions, the works. And get this, the music doesn't have to be good. It just needs data supporting the fact that people are engaging with the song. This helps labels and musicians alike create and promote music specifically designed to juice revenues to the max. This has led to the same kind of environment with music that we see with movies. Why do you think there were so many formulaic superhero movies? Because they make billions. With music, everyone is swinging for the fences using the same data to create the same formulas and ultimately the same sorts of songs. If you think a lot of music is starting to sound exactly the same, now you know why. Committees of musicians and beat makers and producers and lyricists are needed to write a single song using audience engagement data. And the goal of this engagement is to create repetition. The heaviest users of streaming music services tend to skew young. They also tend to listen to their favorite songs over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again. Yeah, and I know that's always been the case with young people going all the way back to portable turntables and 45s. But back then, it was done in private. Now we can document that repetition, analyze it, and come up with another song that will encourage the same behavior. Repetition then pushes the song up the streaming charts and up through the algorithms, so it's exposed to more people who also put it on repeat. And it comes down to this. The people who create songs like this get paid the most. And these are the songs that make the most money for the labels. Hip-hop, rap, R&B, and pop have benefited the most from this musical money ball because those genres have demonstrated the most streaming success. So the labels spend all their time and money promoting that music, And if there's anything left over, it goes to rock or country or jazz or whatever. 
And if you wondered why rock hasn't been a big mainstream force as it once was, there's one explanation. It may very well be true that we will never ever see a post-internet rock band get as big as any pre-internet artist had. In fact, these guys might be the last of the old school rock stars minted in the old fashioned way. Before I leave you, here's a bonus point about streaming. This is point number 23, which deals with co-opting the system. If you are an artist, you have to stream your music and you have to get something on YouTube too, because that's still the biggest source of music discovery on the planet. If you're not on YouTube, then you don't exist for a large portion of the population. Instead, use the data that's available to you. It can help you figure out where and when to tour, how to manage your merch sales, the best time to release new music, and so on. You need to get into data analytics. That's what all the big stars are doing, and that's why they're big stars. Play that game, and your odds of improving your lot will increase. Podcasts for these shows are available through all the platforms. You're encouraged to binge on as many of them as you wish. If you can, rate and review. That helps. Word of mouth is great, too. If you need music news and information on a daily basis, there's my website, which is ajournalofmusicalthings.com. It comes with a free daily newsletter. Just sign up and go. I've also got content on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok on a regular basis. And if you want to communicate anything at all, use Alan at alancross.ca. Technical production for all this is by Rob Johnston. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 